Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. It's uh, my second time in Croatia. My last trip here was to uh, Kula. I'm going there again next uh, next week, but it's lovely to spend some time in Zagreb. It's a beautiful city, so uh, very pleasant to spend time here and enjoy a bit of an escape from the English cold. I'll be talking about Hyman Minsky. Who's heard of Hyman Minsky's name before? Okay, a handful. Um, now in the West, most times when I mention I'm talking about Minsky, most people know who I'm talking about. But if I gave a lecture six years ago, or say eight years ago, on the same topic, the same proportion of hands would go up. Most people simply weren't aware of Minsky's work. So he worked in the underground of economics, outside the mainstream. Now, of course, all the mainstream are claiming to read him, uh, and they're claiming to understand him as well. They're certainly doing the first. Uh, they, I don't believe they're doing the second in terms of understanding it, so I want to explain it from my point of view. But if anybody is inspired by what I have to say today about Minsky and wants to follow up, I'll start with, with a suggestion. Do not read his last book called Stabilising an Unstable Economy. For a range of reasons, I regard that as the worst expression of his views. I can tell you why later, if you like. Uh, if you're going to read anything, the best book to buy is a, is a book of... Of, uh, of short essays called Can It Happen Again? That to me is beautifully expressed in one paper in that book. Virtually choose anyone you like. You'll get the core of his views very well covered. And if you want to get a, a book-length treatment, then read a book called, by him called John Maynard Keynes, which despite its name is not a biography at all. It's named in honour of Keynes. It's not about Keynes. It's his vision how he interprets Keynesian work and a range of others. So he's the person I'll be talking about. And if there's a message that, that Minsky gives, it's the one I've got on my T-shirt, and I hope you can see at reasonable scale there on the graphic. Stability is destabilizing. Very, very different vision of the economy from what you get from conventional economics. So if you look at the conventional equilibrium approach, the, the, the neoclassical approach to economics, first of all, everything is about what happens in equilibrium. There's a very strong focus on needing to define an equilibrium and talk about what happens there in the theory. And if you look at why that originated, you can go back to the 1870s and find that the, one of the founding fathers of the neoclassical school, Leon Volrath, was fundamentally posing himself this question. Can a decentralised market economy reach general equilibrium? Which is an interesting puzzle. Okay? Intellectually, it's like playing a game of chess. Interesting set of rules. Technically, that quest failed. You don't get told that in your textbooks. Uh, I think textbooks do an appalling job of covering the development of economic theory over time. There's numerous ways in which that quest failed. And if you can look in the academic literature, you can find that stated. The answer was no, it can't. And that should have been a force for transforming economics, but instead it persists with the idea of equilibrium. It's altered over time. The equilibrium, the way neoclassical defines it today, is completely different to how it would be defined by one in the 1960s, but still fundamentally equilibrium is a ruling concept. Secondly, individualism. Everything is done from the individual up. You begin from the individual consumer, you talk about the behaviour of that consumer, you then magically get that consumer to represent an entire uh, de aggregate demand curve or market demand curve. Exactly the same thing I, for the firm. Isolated firm, scale it up to the level of the entire market or the entire economy. Uh, and exactly what it behaves at the individual level, you say applies at the aggregate level, which is a fallacy. Okay. Again, there's research to establish this. That does not apply. And my analogy that I, I use this to explain it to students these days, because I'm talking about something which sounds very complicated, emergent properties, is to say, imagine a single molecule of water, H2O. Okay. Can that turn into ice? Is that molecule liquid? Can it evaporate? All the things, can it fall as snow? Now the answer to all those questions is no. If you want to understand water, you have to talk about the interactions of more than one molecule. What, kind of, what the behaviour we take for granted for water is an emergent property of the relationship of different molecules of H2O to each other. So you can't understand water without aggregating and the behaviour of a mass of water is very different to the behaviour of a single molecule of water. Exactly the same thing applies in the economy, but economists have continued pretending that that's not the case. And you can go from an isolated consumer and an isolated firm to the level of the entire market, and the behaviour will be the same. 
totally wrong, but that dominates the way the economics thinks about itself, which I think we have to mature and grow up and get beyond that. And thirdly, barter. When you look at the way you model the economy, you have supply and demand, you don't even talk about money. Money is left out of the system, using what's called the argument that money is just a veil over barter. Uh, and finance is treated as completely separate to economics. If there's any causal link, it's from the economic principles and uh, fundamentals to, the fu to financial valuations. There's no feedback from finance to economics. Now, that is the mainstream. <coughs> Minsky is the, has a very opposite perspective. He started from, the, his, his defining question was, how did the Great Depression, how did it happen? Why did the Great Depression occur? And can it happen again? That was his defining question. So he said to answer that question, and also to answer why it didn't happen between 1945 and 1970, when he wrote this particular paper, he said, you have to have, that, first of all, that question flows obviously from the data. The Great Depression was the biggest catastrophe in the history of capitalism. It led directly to the Second World War. It was a defining feature of what happened in Europe and America as well. Why did it happen? Can it happen again? And why hasn't it happened in the last 35 years? And he wrote. And then he said, to answer this question, it is necessary to have an economic theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible states that a market economy can fall into. And of course, you can't do that with a neoclassical model. So his explanation is fundamentally non-equilibrium. It denies the relevance of equilibrium. That's why I've got this T-shirt. Stability is destabilising. Expresses his views very succinctly. That's a quote, a very abbreviated quote from a sentence of Minsky. The full quote is, uh, stability in a capitalist economy with sophisticated financial institutions is destabilising. So he's seeing a essential role for finance in destabilising a capitalist economy. Secondly, it's a, he's talking about an emergent property, not something you can explain by talking about isolated individuals. You have to be looking at the interaction of different social classes. And rather than, as economists, neoclassical economists, try to interpret Minsky, what they often see is asymmetric information and things like that. Minsky's talking about shared expectations and herd behaviour, not at all about one group knowing more than another and that being the entire explanation. And it's fundamentally monetary. So that's a very, very different foundation. And I often get asked, quite regularly asked, you know, well, yes, OK, that's different, but surely there's something you want to keep with the neoclassical paradigm. There's so much work that's gone into it, enormous amount of intellectual effort, and I respect the intelligence of the people who designed that system. By no means am I saying they lack intelligence. Okay? They just have a bad model. Well, to me, being asked what I'd keep of the neoclassical school, is a bit like asking Copernicus what he'd keep of Ptolemy. You have a very different vision of the same thing. If you look at Copern the, the, the vision of the, the astronomy before Copernicus and, and Tycho Brahe and, and, and Kepler and so on came along and gave us our accurate, real model of the solar system in which we live and then finally the universe, Ptolemy's model had an Earth-centric vision. The Earth was the centre of the universe. That's why things fell down. Everything falls towards the centre. Motion was determined by God. Gravity didn't exist. Okay. God just made everything move. Uh, and there was Aristotle began with the whole idea that the universe was centred on the Earth and consisted, I think, of 55 concentric crystal spheres, all of which rotated around the Earth perfectly because the, the heavens were perfect. Now, that was rather hard to reconcile with the vision of what's called the, the planets. And planet... I don't know how many of you know this, but planet is the ancient Greek word for wanderer. Because when you look at the planets, the four things you could see with your naked eye in the sky, they moved all over the place. They wobbled from backwards and rounds and forwards. So this underlying paradigm from Aristotle could not explain what was observed. And Ptolemy developed the idea that on these perfect circles, there were other perfect circles that planets actually rotated upon. And that explained the eccentric motion you'd see of the of the planets. That explains the deviation from the core paradigm, which to me is like neoclassical economists using frictions to explain why the economy isn't always in equilibrium. It takes time to friction slow it down. Now, Copern the Copernican vision is the sun is the centre. Motion is determined by gravity. And you have the simplest possible explanation for the observed phenomena that we're all rotating around the sun. Okay? And tiny deviations exist from pure, pure circular motion um, the, the, which 
we, we do see tiny deviations from the actual model that Newton gave us. That's because of the interaction of the gravity of other planets with each other, which is actually a complex story. And we explained that back in 1899, as it happens with the French mathematician Poincaré. So those two paradigms completely incommensurable. If you asked an astronomer, what have you kept of Ptolemy? He'd say nothing. Next question. Okay. Well, I'm saying the same about the neoclassicals. I don't think we can keep anything here. They're utterly incompatible, and I believe Minsky had the right idea. So his vision was to, as he said, it's saying that depressions are not caused by imperfections in the system. Okay. He said they're caused by in, the inherent flaws in capitalism. But flaws that capitalism has to have, you can't eliminate them. But they're not necessarily totally bad either. But the idea of perfection itself may be uh, a bastardisation. So he said this instability is due to characteristics the financial system must possess if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. And that will generate signals which cause both accelerating desire to invest and the finance that enables that investment to be, to be financed. So his ambition was to model both booms and busts. Okay? Explaining just the slump isn't enough. You've got to explain the boom as well. And he said we need to have a, a theory which makes Great Depressions one of the possible state we're in, one which can also identify what's different about the post-1945 world to the world of, up to 1929 when the crisis began. And he said, first of all, the crises that occur have to be normal events in an unconstrained economy. Rather than something which is an aberration or due to an exogenous shock, it must be something normal. You have to explain why it didn't happen in that time period, and as he mentioned, from 48 to 66, and he times the beginning of our financial instability right back to 1966, said that uh, there was no serious financial crisis, there was no debt deflation. But since 1966, and if you look at the history, you'll find that this is a very valid perspective, there have been a series of financial crises. He was writing that in 1982. We're talking more than 20 years before the crisis finally broke out, a quarter of a century before it. He saw the beginning signs of a return to that period. So looking from 48 to 78, he was saying that the, the first credit crunch that occurred, the first time the Federal Reserve had to intervene to prevent a financial crisis was in 1966. And there was a run on what are called negotiable certificates of deposit, mainly centred around a, a, a company funding the Penn Central Railroad. And then 1974 to 75. So the crisis, we look back and see the oil crisis. What Minsky saw, and he's correct, was a debt bubble that burst in 1970, between 73 and 74 in most countries. The oil crisis came after that, and in many ways it saved the system from having a crisis back then. So that's the second one he mentioned, the Franklin National Bank of New York, failing after it had a run on its overseas branch. So looking at that, he's saying that given this history, even, even after the great crisis of 1929, it's feasible to regard financial crises as systemic, not something which is accidental, but something which happens normally. So the anomaly is not the crisis of 1929. The anomaly is the 20 or 30 years after the Second World War, when there were no major crises. And since the mid-60s, he's saying this tendency to crises has reasserted itself. And of course now we've lived through the biggest crisis since the Great Depression. So, ah, <laughs> Pardon that animation there. This is looking at the 19th century trade cycle. The reason for looking at it is if you look at the ups and downs using very crude uh, de decade-long data, but you look at the ups and downs, what you see is a financial crisis about every 15 years, 15 to 20 years. And you see booms and slumps in prices as well. Frequent falls of wages, frequent deflation, etc., etc. So even if, if you look at a lot of critics of uh, capitalism, modern capitalism, of the Austrian school, their critics have say it'd all be better if we had total free enterprise. Well, in many ways, the 19th century America was close to free enterprise in that sense. Tiny government sector, despite the existence of the Civil War and all the military stuff. The scale of the government was quite tiny. Income tax didn't exist, etc., etc. So you pretty much had your free market back then and you had financial crises every, every 15 to 20 years. Now, Post-1973, we're getting a different form of instability. And here he's saying that the instability we're seeing has been attenuated by what the Federal Reserve does uh, with its manipulation of the interest rates and its attempt to manipulate the money supply, and also what happens from an immensely large government sector. Now, again, we take it for granted that the government sector is about 
to 40% of GDP. If you go back to pure unbridled capitalism back in the 19th century, it was about 5 to 10% maximum. So a much, much smaller government sector, and therefore what the government did back then is much smaller than what it can do more. But he argued, and that's actually where he made a mistake, for the reason I'm going to argue in favour of mathematical thinking shortly, is he said that accelerating inflation was a necessary side effect of every time a crisis was aborted. Now that was happening up to 1982. But from 1982 on, we started getting decelerating inflation. So that's the overall perspective, and I think you can see how different it is to the mainstream neoclassical you would have learned so far. But how do you turn it into a theory? Well, you have to come from somewhere. Everybody comes from somewhere. You have somebody you base your ideas upon. And, of course, you can't put that framework on a neoclassical foundation. That's why I think it's quite funny watching people like Paul Krugman and Eckertson and a few others trying to write models, models of Minsky, well, they start from equilibrium. There's a, there's a, I don't know how many of you know Irish jokes. Not many, I imagine. Okay. But, uh, I'm sure you could make it into a Serbian joke or a Slovenian joke, whatever <laughs> else. But there's a, a joke about a, uh, a tourist in uh, Ireland being in, in, in um, one of the two cities, and I've forgotten the names of the cities, Dublin and uh, Belfast. And he goes up to somebody in Dublin and says, excuse me, I want to get to Belfast. How do I get there? And the guy replies, oi, if you wanted to go there, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> now, ironically, that's actually extremely intelligent, okay? Because initial conditions do matter. But how do you start from? He started, the initial conditions for, for, for Minsky were Marx, Schumpeter, Fischer, and finally Keynes. He did not start with Keynes. And you also will not find a single reference to Marx in his writings by the way, he has a very, he doesn't have a labour theory of value interpretation of Marx and neither do I. I see that as a bastardisation of Marx. Marx contributed to it, but it's, I think, a very pedestrian view of Marx. There's a much richer view of Marx you can find if you read stuff outside Capital Volume 1. Read it, particularly the Grundrisse, if you want to see a very rich vision and a monetary vision in, in Marx. But Schumpeter was his PhD supervisor. <coughs> And Irving Fisher was the person whose paper he first tried to build his, PA, his PhD model on. So the alternative model paradigm they've got, all those three thinkers have a very dynamic and non-equilibrium way of thinking, and from a modern perspective, a modern mathematical perspective, they were describing what we'd call a complex system, and it's fundamentally monetary as well. So if you look at Minsky, here's a statement I've mentioned beforehand, that capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises and depressions. Schumpeter in a beautiful set of sentences that says there can be no such thing as a stable social system and yet we're trying to model capitalism as if it is stable. He said, any system transforms itself simply by its mere working and if history teaches us nothing else, it teaches us that. Well, that's omitted from the neoclassical way of thinking. And Keynes, again, people often quote this, the expression where Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead, as though it's a dismissive thing about the importance of the long run. No, it was a dismissive thing about the way conventional economists model the economy. And he said, in this long run, we're all dead. Economists set themselves too easy, too useless a task. If in tempestuous seasons they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. It's just the wrong framework to be working from. Now, I give a very detailed history of economic thought of Minsky uh, in the next 30 or 40 or so slides, so I know I haven't got that much time here, but I'll leave that with uh, Dimitri so you can put it up on a website and you can download it if you want to check it out in detail. So I want to now go into the financial instability hypothesis and how Minsky developed those insights into a theory. And what he did would be very familiar to anybody who works in differential equations. You have to, say, you have to take a starting point in some dynamic non-equilibrium process. So you your starting point and look at the, what he's talking about here as well. The natural starting place for analysing the relation between debt and income. Now, he means, he means private debt there. That's not even part of what you learn in economic theory. So he's looking at a variable which is not part of the mainstream at all. So, but he says the natural starting point for analysing the relationship between the two is to take an economy with a cyclical past, so you must have a cyclical model, that is now doing well. So the economy is booming. So the inherited debt structure reflects a time in the past when it didn't do so well. So there was some preceding crisis caused by debt. And he said, given that preceding crisis, the level of, of equity backing, the, the debt to equity ratio that firms are willing to consider is conservative. People are, are, require more cover 
for the financial positions they take on than in fact are required by the existing conditions. Because the economy is doing well, two things become evident in boardrooms. And notice he's not talking about a perfectly competitive market here. He's talking about a Wall Street vision where decisions are made by, large, by the boards of large corporations and they're largely financial as well as industrial decisions. Existing debts are easily validated and units that were heavily in debt prospered. It pays to lever. They said after the event, you realise you had too high a margin. In other words, if you were more highly geared, you would have made more money. Whereas what they were worried about being more highly geared in the, in the past meant you went bankrupt when the crisis hit. So over a period of time, the level of debt firms are willing to take on changes. In the deal-making that goes on between banks, investment bankers and businessmen, the acceptable amount of debt used in financing various types of activity and positions increases. Now again, this is a view that's integrating finance and economics and talking about it at a large-scale corporate level, not talking about it in terms of competitive firms and all that, pardon me, but nonsense. Uh, so the increase in the weight of debt financing raises the price of capital assets. Share prices and house prices start to rise and the economy is transformed into a boom economy. And that period transforms a period of tranquil growth into a period of speculative excess. So a period of tranquility, that's why the statement is said, stability is destabilising. Because you live in an unstable system, a period of stable growth leads to rising expectations and extra debt and financing which then destabilises the system. So stable growth is inconsistent with the manner in which investment is financed in our capitalist economies uh, and the extent to which it's determined by the market. The market lets you expand during a boom and forces you to contract during a slump. So this is, again, where Mark Minsky differs very substantially from plenty of other critics of capitalism, people like Brown and Sweezy and so on. A lot of Marxist critiques, critics of capitalism criticise it as an economy that tends towards stagnation. You would have heard Marxist economists talking about the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, which is a stagnation tendency. Minsky's saying, no, the real instability is upward. The tendency to transform doing well into a speculative investment boom is the basic instability in the capitalist economy. Very different vision of what you'll get from standard Marxist type thinking. Now that's also, of course, missed by the ISLM modelling that neoclassicals use, and especially by what they now call dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which in my opinion are neither dynamic nor general. Okay. They're stochastic equilibrium models. Uh, because the process is fundamentally non-equilibrium. And you can't measure, you can't even begin to consider non-equilibrium processes unless you have time in there. And the essential non-equilibrium phenomena Minsky's talking about is debt, which is also not in those models, private debt. And DSG models think are even worse because they enforce equilibrium outcomes on, on uh, uh, systems which are mathematically unstable. The basic DSG model has an unstable equilibrium. Therefore, you can't linearize around that equilibrium, which is precisely what's done to solve most DSG models. So there's all sorts of breaches, not just of economic logic, but mathematical logic in how these systems are put together. And ironically, I find myself forever fighting a, a rearguard action against Paul Krugman, who's trying to resurrect ISLM over the failure of DSGE models. And of course, uh, John Hicks was the person who developed the ISLM model. He rejected that in the late 70s. This is one paper that uh, was the beginning of him realising the flaws in his own model. Uh, I've linked another one here as well, uh, just down here, called ISLM and Explanation, which is published in the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics, and that's why most neoclassicals don't even know the paper exists. But in that paper, Hicks said, look, it was all wrong. It only works if you can model the economy permanently in equilibrium. And the most important and interesting times in the economy where economists can make a contribution are where it's out of equilibrium. So he so said, we should trash the model completely. They're still trying to bring it back. So the, I think the neoclassical framework has got even worse over time for handling debt and time, which are the most important things it can do. So let's go through Minsky's verbal model in detail now. And it starts with an economy in historical time. Now, history and time, as I said, are both left out of the mainstream. If we're in historical time, there's been a crisis in the recent past. Now, the crisis before the global financial crisis was the 1990s recession. 
And that recession is what enabled Bill Clinton to get to power over the Republicans after dominance by Reagan all those years ago. But in that aftermath, let's say we're talking about 92, 93, there's been a debt-induced crisis. The crisis in 1990s was caused by a debt bump. And this is Minsky's perspective. So you had a debt-based crisis. It's in the 1990s now. You've got through... You've, the economy is now starting to grow once more. And, but at the time, everybody is conservative about the level of debt they'll take on. So both firms and banks are conservative. Therefore, only conservatively funded projects get, get money to go ahead. But because the economy has recovered, most of those projects succeed. Since they succeed, both the firms and the banks think our risk premiums were too high. We should reduce our risk premium, take on a bigger level of leverage next time round. So the debt to equity ratio starts to rise, accepted ratio, and you start to revalue assets upwards, which of course leads into the telecommunication boom and the dot com bubble, which followed after that. And then you get what Minsky called the euphoric economy. <clears throat> and I think a great PhD thesis for a, somebody in journalism and on the edge of economics would be to analyse the use of the word euphoric or euphoria in financial, <coughs> financial newspapers like the Financial Times, because you find them using the word long before they ever read Minsky talking about the state of expectations in the booming economy. So you have self-fulfilling expectations for a while. <coughs> Pardon me. Because of a decline in risk aversion, you have more investment taking place, and because there's more investment, the economy does grow faster. You also get rising asset prices, which makes it profitable to speculate on those prices. And the more leverage you take out, the better you do at that speculation as well. And this is an important point I'll get to quite shortly in the presentation. That increased willingness to lend increases the money supply, which increases demand for both goods and services and assets. So there's an expansion in the money supply, enabling riskier investments still, many of which are losing money, by the way. Okay? When you're having euphoric expectations, you're not making sensible investments. You're overdoing it. Asset speculation rises, and you get what he calls Ponzi financiers. Now, they're individuals, capitalists, whose cash flow from the businesses they own is less than the debt servicing costs of those businesses. So technically they're bankrupt. How do they stay in business? First of all they have to continue borrowing money. So they've got an insatiable demand for debt to roll over their existing debts. Secondly they profit by selling those assets in a rising market. So they're absolutely dependent upon a cash flow to keep them from becoming literally bankrupt while the boom is on and to turn their extreme positions into a gain, the market has to continue rising. So they're incredibly fragile. And that means that they're willing to pay virtually any interest rate to get money. So if there's a market set component to the rate of interest, that tends to rise as well. Now eventually you have this reduced sensitivity to debt and interest rate levels. Nobody, nobody cares about paying even a 10% rate of interest if you expect a 30% rise in the stock market. But you can't control that level of speculation by fiddling with the interest rates as the Federal Reserve tries to do. The demand and the supply of money gets increased, market rates rise, but eventually you've got all these factors that can bring you unstuck. The Ponzi's are losing money. If you take a look in some neoclassical textbooks, you'll often find them saying, we assume the non-existence of Ponzi finance. I'm not joking. They actually make that assumption. We ex I assume the non-existence of gravity, so I'm going to jump to the moon. You, know, you can't do that, but that's what they do. Now, they're, they're accumulating debt. And if they can't roll over a financial situation, they will go bankrupt. My favourite example of a Ponzi is actually an Australian, given my knowledge of my own country, called Christopher Scase, who made a $3 billion takeover bid for MGM before Sony took it over, which was turned down by the board and one week after his $3 billion takeover bid was turned down, he went bankrupt because he couldn't pay a $12 million loan installment. Okay. If he'd got that $3 billion takeover, he would have borrowed more than enough to pay that, pay the $12 billion interest installment with, borrow, with spare change and keep on going. So that means they, suddenly the whole thing falls apart. There's plenty of euphoric investments. They can also fail. And rising interest rates can also make conservatively funded projects speculative. And also you get a change in income distribution and costs. And I'll show you that in the models that I do later. So non-Ponzi's can come into the market and attempt to sell their assets to finance their suddenly unserviceable debts. You get a flood of the asset market. The asset market collapses. And you go back to where you began from. 
The Ponzi's are the first ones to go bankrupt because they can't sell an asset for a profit anymore and their debt servicing cost is far greater than their cash flow and now it's exposed. Warren Buffett made that wonderful statement about you only see who's naked when the tide goes out. Okay, well, these are the most naked people around. Asset prices collapse. Debt to equity ratios actually increase for a while. The expansion of the money supply goes into reverse. Investment evaporates. Economic growth slows down or goes into reverse. And you're back where you started again. Now I've pretty much described what happened from 1992 to 2008. But the difference about 2008 was it wasn't just a cycle. It kept on going down further. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Aminsky said there are two things which can attenuate this process. One is high inflation. If you have high inflation, then debts are repaid by the rising price level. And that's his explanation for the stagflation period in the 1970s and 1980s. And you then, of course, renew the cycle once inflation reduces those debt burdens. The other is, is uh, with, with low inflation, on the other hand, if you have low inflation, like we have now, then you can't rely upon the rising price level, and you can get a chain reaction given deflation that makes even non-speculative businesses fold and you remain in a depression. So there's high inflation versus low inflation, a major factor in his thinking. The other is big government. If you have a big government sector, then even, even if it uh, tries to not to do this, and we're seeing the European Union behaving that way insanely during this crisis, its anti-cyclical spending tends to attenuate how extreme the cycle is. So because government spending will rise when unemployment rises, and government taxation will fall when incomes and profits fall, there's a countervailing influence, like an air conditioning system effectively, preventing a room getting as cold as it would if you had the outside temperature during winter or as hot as it would during summer. And you get a, you get a renewal of the cycle and that comes to the end. So that's Minsky's vision. I, it was an incredibly compelling vision to me when I first read that in 1987. That's why I decided to do my PhD, building a model of Minsky's cycle back then. And because he was ignored in the mainstream until 2008. So I see the crisis in 2008 is not just a crisis for the economy, it's a crisis for economic theory as well. And economic theory still hasn't honestly confronted that crisis. Uh, it was, of course, the crisis itself was completely unanticipated by the mainstream models. And the DSG models in particular were guilty here. My favourite quote on this front comes from the OECD. Now, you can't get much more mainstream than the OECD. This is the organisation that advises all the governments of the wealthy countries. And in June of 2007, the advice they gave to politicians was that their central forecast remains quite benign. Okay. You don't have cancer, don't worry, go back home. Stop taking drugs. For well, those ones anyway. A soft landing in the United States, a strong and sustained cover in Europe, strong job creation and falling unemployment. That's what they were telling politicians two months before the crisis began. Now, after the crisis, the defence they're making is, well, you can't predict crises. Okay. You can't be able... It's like a rolling a, a dice. You can't predict which number's going to come up. They say, well, maybe nonlinear models might do a better job, but they're too complicated. And the third one, and I love this, this is from Olivia Blanchard, who's now the chief economist for the IMF, who said, linear models are OK if we can stay away from dark corners. OK. Now, well, my response to all those three is, first of all, the failure wasn't due to the unpredictability of the crisis. The failure was because their models left out the factor which caused the crisis. When you include that factor in a non-neoclassical model, it has to be non-equilibrium, it has to be monetary, therefore non-neoclassical, the crisis was obviously going to happen at some point. Secondly, complicated, complex models, non-linear models can be complicated, true, but a simple complex model, which might sound like an oxymoron, but a simple complex model can give you the insights you need. And that's why the model that I built, which is a simple complex model, gave me that insight when I built it back in 1992. And thirdly, how do you keep away from dark corners if you don't know what causes darkness? But fundamentally, we're still in that dark corner. Olivia Blanchard could not identify why the crisis happened. And if I told him why it happened, he wouldn't believe me because it's not part of his theory. But we're still in that dark corner. So to avoid dark corners, you've got to know what creates them. You've got to have a model that can actually generate what you've been through, which, of course, brings us back to Minsky's model. So it doesn't have a sound explanation for the crisis at all. And if you look at, uh, back to the previous major crisis and ask, how did neoclassical explain that? The person who's regarded as the expert amongst neoclassical economists on the Great Depression is, of course, Ben Bernanke, 
And in talking about it, he says this, this statement which I completely agree with. The main fact that depressing aggregate demand was a worldwide contraction in world money supplies. And that's correct. What's wrong is he blames the Federal Reserve for causing it. He said when you look at the data, uh, it undermines the stinging critique of the Federal Reserve by Friedman and Schwartz. And then talking later at the 90th birthday party for Milton Friedman, this is his final few words in the speech, he said, let me abuse my status as an official of the Federal Reserve, so he's now running the organisation he blamed for the Great Depression. I'd like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you were right, we did it. We're very sorry. But thanks to you, we won't do it again. So he's blaming the whole thing on an exogenous fact of being the Federal Reserve and saying, we won't do it again. Well, basically, whoops. I think it was poetic justice that he was close to being the chairman of the Federal Reserve when this crisis began. <coughs> um, so, without warning, the economy collapses. Well, this is what they were looking at. What he was seeing beforehand was this period of declining volatility in inflation and unemployment. So if you look at the time trend here, you can see that the peak in unemployment each, on each uh, recession was lower, Inflation was falling all the way down. Then the crisis hits and suddenly unemployment escalates like crazy. And for a very brief while, before the scale of the rescue popped in, inflation became deflation. People tend to forget that, but America had a period where prices were falling by 2% per annum before the enormous stimulus packages from both the government and the Federal Reserve went into power. So, why didn't they see it coming? The first is a false prior. Even though he's blaming this contraction in the money supply for reducing aggregate demand, at a fundamental level, the neoclassical theory says the amount of money doesn't matter. According to standard neoclassical micro and macro, the level of money and the rate of change of money should only cause nominal changes, inflation, not real changes in economic activity. And that's built into mainstream thinking. Obviously, at the micro level, with the idea of a, of a money illusion, if you give students the nonsense exercise of indifference curves to describe uh, preferences and a budget line to describe income and prices, but then say double all income and double prices, what happens? The answer in the multiple choice question is nothing. Okay, that says money doesn't matter, ignore it. Now, that's embedded in micro, but it's now turned up in macro because effectively today what's called macro is applied microeconomics. And this is Lucas in the very first paper where he started doing the demolition job on uh, previous large-scale, well, they call them Keynesian models, but large-scale econometric models, and said that looking at the data, what you see is, what an, what an economist sees is a volatile demand curve moving up and down a fairly stable upward-sloping supply curve. But then he says, but that's strange, because according to the theory where we have the absence of money illusion, that should mean the supply curve is vertical, in which curve the case the changes in monetary demand should simply cause price fluctuations. They shouldn't have any real impact upon the economy. So that's embedded in the neoclassical framework. That's the first false prior. The second false prior is that the level of private debt does not matter. And here we get slightly more complicated. This comes from the loanable funds model of how money, or the role of money in the economy. And Bernanke used this back when he wrote his, his essays on the Great Depression. He used it to dismiss Irving Fisher. Now, I mentioned, of course, Fisher was the person that Minsky based his theories upon. So he dismissed Fisher's debt deflation theory by saying the idea goes back to Fisher and he envisaged a process with falling asset and commodity prices, uh, prices calling, causing pressure on nominal debtors, etc., etc. And he says it was, he said it influenced Roosevelt. So it had a policy impact, but he said it was less influential in academic circles because of the counter-argument that debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors. Now, just think about that for a moment. When somebody goes bankrupt, they don't pay their debts back. There's not a redistribution. Even that statement itself is absurd. But he then goes on from that position and says, given that absurd point of view, the only way that you could have a, d a change in debt causing a crisis would be there's a huge difference in the marginal consumption propensities of savers and debtors. And he said, that doesn't apply, so we can ignore Irving Fisher. 
So I see him not as an expert on the Great Depression, but an expert on explanations of the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical theory. And the only explanation that's consistent well, the murder mystery style is the butler did it. You can blame it on the Federal Reserve. You can't blame it on capitalism. It wasn't suicide, it was murder. Now, this is being maintained today by people like Paul Krugman, who again says, ignore people who say banks might matter. He says, when debt's rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. It's really a case of less patient people borrowing from more patient people. So the spending power of one person goes down, the spending power of another person goes up. And he knocks... Richard Koo and a few others on that basis, including me. Um, so what I want to do is take a look at those views. And what I've done here, and I'm going to have to do it quickly because I'm realising I'm getting tight on time here. Uh, how long should I continue going for? Can you give me an idea? Pardon? Don't just keep on talking? Yeah. Okay, we'll have a late dinner, whatever, that's good. Um, and what, what, um, the, the model that the neoclassicals have, thank you for that, the model the neoclassicals have is that lending is a transfer of spending power between a saver and a borrower, and banks are just intermediaries. So what I've done, and I'm about to show you here, is I've taken a paper done by Krugman and Eggertson, and I've put their idea of lending, where a patient agent lends to an impatient agent, and the bank is just the intermediary that arranges the loan and charges the fee for it. I've put that into my computer software package I call Minsky. So and I then what I have is there's a consumer sector that does the lending, an investment sector that does the borrowing, and then they both have to hire workers, buy up from each other, sell to the workers in the bank, uh, and they then what I then do is I change the way in which the investing agent uh, borrows and repays and see what happens. Does debt actually matter? So the way I do it is with a table like this. Is anybody doing accounting here? Nobody. Okay. I didn't do it either. I've learned it the hard way by realising the importance of double entry bookkeeping when I do financial modelling, monetary modelling. So what I've got here is set up following what's called the law of accounting, which unlike a lot of economic laws actually does apply. And that says that assets minus liabilities equals equity. That's the basic rule. And then the way that the accountants set up their system is, is to say that all rows have to sum to zero. So to sum to zero, I've got to treat assets as positive and liabilities, and also equity, which is a bit strange to look at, but I've got to treat them as negative. So if you look here, I've got a reserves of 100, and I've got to get the liabilities of the deposit account of the investment agent, the deposit account of the consumer agent, and the deposit account of the workers. They're all negative, and I show the bank's equity is also negative, and the sum of that row is zero. So that's the initial conditions. The same thing applies when I go and take a look at the flows as well. And a flow is from positive to negative. It looks strange there. Lending is adding a positive sum to a negative amount. So it's actually reducing the magnitude of the bank's liability to the lender. It's adding a negative sum to a negative amount, increasing liability on the other side. So that's why it makes sense. It's a bit like the way electrical engineers model that electricity is flowing from positive to negative, even though we, have, we know that electrons, as we define them, are negative, negatively charged. So that's repayment. Notice debt doesn't turn up there. That's because we're looking at the economy from the point of view of the bank. But the debt in this model is not an asset of the bank. It's an asset of the lender, it's the consumer sector. So I've got to show the consumer sector as well. And now what you see is, I'm now showing the consumer's deposit account as a positive sum. Which is why it makes sense to say it as a negative from the bank's point of view. And what you have is lending, therefore means taking money out of the, bank's, uh, out of the deposit account of the bank, uh, but what it gives you is an increase in the asset of the debt the investment sector owes to you. So that looks more natural if you look at it that way. And of course the consumer sector has to do with that money in the meantime. So when I put it together, this is the software package I call Minsky, which is open source. You're all welcome to download it from SourceForge and give it a try. But what I can do with that model, I'll just show you that there's the banking sector model I mentioned a moment ago. So that's the table for the banking sector. And this is the table for the consumer sector. So that's where the tables are in the background and all these things here are uh, elements that let me define mathematical relationships, rates of flows of debt and stuff like that. And over here I've got a control over the rate at which lending occurs and the rate at which debt's repaid. So if I simulate this model, initially you'll see the growth level hits pretty much zero. Notice here you have a <coughs> rising level of debt and the money supply is not changing. Now if I increase the rate of lending, and decrease the rate of repayment, you'll see that the level of debt starts to grow much more rapidly. 
But not much happened to the rate of growth. In fact, it fell for a while there. Now, if I let it go on for long enough, you'll see the level of debt starts to exceed the level of money in the economy. That's quite feasible. Lending and lending a turnover of money can have debt exceeding the level of money supply. Now let's have a dramatic slowdown in the rate of lending. Actually, the economy booms a bit, and a dramatic increase in how fast people repay. The economy booms again. Okay. But what happens, you know, the debt level is now plunging, but growth has gone back to zero again. I've been simulating the model now for 20 years, and dramatic changes to the level of lending, trivial changes to GDP. If loanable funds is correct, you can ignore the banking sector. Okay. That's, that's my point here, that if they were institutionally correct about the nature of lending, then they'd be correct to ignore it, even though their model of lending is wrong. Okay. Now, let's, uh, let's go back to my presentation here. Okay. Okay. So why, why doesn't debt matter in that model? Well, I'm going to take you're going to use your brain cells a bit here, so brace yourselves. You always need a drink after this one. Uh, imagine you can divide the economy into three sectors. Just label them S1, S2 and S3. And I'm going to show expenditure which is financed out of existing cash in capital letters and expenditure financed out by borrowing money from somewhere using lowercase letters. And I look at three situations where you can't borrow at all, where you can borrow from other sectors, which is loanable funds, or where you can borrow from a bank, which is endogenous money. And the first case is what you might call Say's Law, with a bit of a twist. So if you look at that, I've now got the, each of those vertical columns is net income, and each row is the expenditure by a sector and then what it spends its money on. So the negative sum of the diagonal is aggregate demand. The middle part's sector one is spending amounts A plus B, and spending on sector two and sector three respectively. So if you sum up that diagonal, you get aggregate demand. But if you sum up the uh, off diagonals, you get aggregate income. Now obviously the net of both is zero. The net sum of that table is obviously zero. Okay? But that's where aggregate demand and aggregate income come from. Now if I sum up and see what's aggregate demand and aggregate income, obviously they're identical to each other. Not that they're equal, they are the same thing. That's why I've got an identi identity sign there rather than an equal sign in the text. Now, what about loanable funds? Well, sector one can borrow B from sector two and spend it on sector three. Okay. And I'm going to have... That means, of course, that sector one's funds for spending have increased by B. But simultaneously, sector two's spending is split by B, and I'm going to split that 50-50 between the other two sectors. So if you look at this table... What you get now is there's a plus B, additional spending, which is enabled by the borrowing for the first sector, but that then becomes income on the other side. But that increase in spending from sector one is counted by a decrease in spending by sector two. So the aggregate outcome is still exactly the same as it was for no borrowing if possible at all. What about if you borrow from a bank? When you lend from a bank, the assets of the bank are the loans. They rise. The liabilities of the bank are the deposits. They also rise. So it's a perfect matching of the two. What you get is an increased spending power for sector one with no offsetting decrease in spending power for sector two. So when I look at this now, I have the, the plus B on the first line, but there's no matching minus B on the second. So when I add this up, I find aggregate demand includes the B and so does aggregate income, the little b. So the change in debt has been a direct boost to both demand and income. So the aggregate demand amount is greater than if there was no borrowing. So this is the, the logic behind the institutional difference I'm about to show you. So an increase in debt causes an equivalent increase in both expenditure and income. And when I modify to show bank lending, this now gets complicated, so brace yourselves. But what I'm now looking at is the flow of lending from the banking sector. So a DDT, a rate of change of debt with respect to time, where time is dimensioned in years. And I've now got a banking equity section as well. Pardon me, wrong part of my animation here. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to change my model to make the debt an asset of the banking sector and see what happens to that model I've shown you a moment ago, just to illustrate before I go to the mathematics. So let's try that. I'll go back over to the model here. Reset it to zero, and then go to that consumer sector's table I've showed you a moment ago, and I can delete the loan column there. And then I'm going to delete lending and debt repayment, 
and interest payments and the bank fee as operations between the consumer sector and the investment sector. But Minsky, the software package, remembers that the debt's still there as a liability in the investment sector and somebody's asset is somebody else's liability. So if I click on the asset column here and add an additional asset column, Minsky goes looking for what might be a liability for somewhere else that can therefore be an asset here and sell so the debt's still there. So it brings across the operations from the, uh, from, the, from the debtor's point of view. All I need to do now is say, well, the interest payments are actually made to the bank. I've got to spell it properly as well. And I might as well delete this bank fee, which is just the fiction of loanable funds. So there are other changes I need to make to make the model completely consistent, about two or three more changes. <coughs> but I'll leave it that for the sake of time. And I'll go back and set the initial values to the same values I had beforehand when the model began the simulation. <coughs> Pardon me. Now you can see for a start the economy is growing. And the amount of money in the economy is growing with the amount of debt. So the economy is borrowing more money. The exact opposite of what Krugman asserted is reality once you say banks lend money, which is a pretty obvious fact, but it's left out of their model. If I also then have an increase in the rate of lending and a decrease in the rate of repayment, there's a boom in the economy. The growth rate goes through the roof and you can see the amount of money and debts rising. If you then have the economy going back to rapid repayment of debt and very slow lending, there's a slump. And I'll reset it back to where I started again, which is what everybody's trying to do these days without quite knowing that's what they're doing and you get back to a level of growth again. But a change in the rate of growth of lending can cause a boom and then cause a slump. And it's exactly what we went through in the financial crisis by leaving this whole issue out. That's why neoclassicals didn't see this thing coming. So you can see the impact of those simple changes there. Okay. Now, just to... One thing, I'm, this, this is to be intimidating because I often get told that people who criticise neoclassical economics don't understand mathematics. Okay. But here are the equations behind the loanable funds model. And these are the equations behind the endogenous money model. Now, strangely enough, only a few little changes are necessary to go from one to the other. So the differences are that these three terms, which are in the re rate of change of debt for the consumer sector, disappear. And the interest term, which is shown as being paid to the consumer sector, goes across and it's paid to the banking sector instead. That's all the changes that are necessary to go from a vision where bank debt and money don't matter to where bank debt and money are absolutely critical to understanding capitalism. So that's, that's the importance there. This is the one I was talking about intimidating with beforehand. This is now showing, when you look at in terms of a flow of debt over time and you include uh, banks' deposit accounts and people banks paying, being paid, paying interest on the deposit accounts as well, you get terms that include the rate of change of debt turning up as part of both aggregate demand and aggregate income and gross financial transactions also turn up. So a full set of equations to specify the nature of demand in a monetary economy say that it's due to the turnover of existing money, which is pretty much Milton Friedman's money velocity times the amount of money, plus gross financial transactions, both deposit interest and debt interest being positively counted in aggregate demand, and the change in debt. And that's the essential element that I've used to see the crisis coming, and this is the theoretical background to it all. So you get this argument that income and expenditure in a capitalist economy, a non-debt financed expenditure, plus the change in debt, plus gross financial transactions. And that's a monetary vision of the quantity theory of money, if you like. We're actually saying, where does the change in money come from? And it ends up saying that, as well as Friedman's argument about prices times output being velocity times money, you've also got plus new debt. That's where the growth in the system comes from. So debt's an essential to growth in our capitalist economy, back to Minsky's argument, it also finances the investment and causes the downturns. So that's the, that's the, and when you look at, in terms of the rate of change of GDP, you then have a term in the acceleration of debt. So you have to have a monetary vision of capitalism, and the reason they didn't see this crisis coming, the neoclassicals, was leaving debt out. It's an enormous omitted variable problem in economic theory, which is why I bang on about it so much. So it wasn't unpredictable. It's just they left out the variable that caused the crisis. When you include it, it's obvious. That's the rate of change and the rate of acceleration of private debt are the indicators. And that's what I, when I saw this level of, of, of debt coming, that's why I saw the crisis 
coming along inevitably. This is a, a bit of repetition here, so I'll just dive through this slide rather rapidly. But what you can get, the, the reason debt is so dramatically important is because change in debt can be positive or negative. You can boost demand or it can take away from it. Whereas rates slow down, and the demand for money itself can only rise or fall. It won't go negative. So when you include the level of private debt and you look at it, you find that the crisis is predictable because, first of all, the level of private debt was unprecedented, not just in the post-war period, but actually in the history of capitalism. And the rate of change of debt was too high to be sustainable. It had to stop. And when it started to slow down, even just the slowdown in the rate of growth of debt was going to cause a crisis. So that's why I went public back in December of 2005 saying a crisis was inevitable. And then you look at it, you can explain what happened not just in our crisis but the Great Depression as well on the basis of the role of private debt. So here's looking at a very long-term view. I put this data together by combining about three data series working backwards from the modern one, tacking on earlier data series and making them compatible. But it gives me a view of private debt in America from 1834. And there is American data on government debt going back to 1790. When you take a look at it, the red line is private debt. The blue line is government debt. Now, all the politicians and conventional economists obsess about the blue line. The red's far bigger, and it's actually the driving force in the economy. Now, using different analysis to me, Wynne Godley began warning of the crisis back in 1998. Same basic argument, slightly different logic. And he said there has to be a crisis when this rate of growth of debt slows down. It went on far longer than Wynne thought it would, and I started warning about it in 2006. But you can see what's happened and what's common between the two periods. Back in the Great Depression, a peak and then a collapse in the level of debt, the only time you're going to find that pattern again is what we're going through right now, though there was a little bit of a precursor back in the 1990s. <clears throat> so the crisis began when the rate of growth of debt slowed down. And this is now looking at the annual data from the 19, 1920s. The red line is the rate of change of private debt. The blue line is unemployment. I think you can see the negative correlation there. It's minus 0.78. So a single variable gives you that level of correlation with very crude data. The data for today is even more breathtaking. This is the correlation for today's rate of change of private debt and level of unemployment. The correlation coefficient is minus 0.93. Yeah. I just can't get neoclassical economists to consider this because according to them it should be zero, therefore it's zero. That's a bit different to zero. I think it might even be significantly different to zero. And when you look at the rate of change of unemployment and the acceleration of debt, then you get equally impressive correlations, minus 0.88 between the acceleration of debt and the change in the unemployment level. So that's how powerful, that's how obvious this signal was that a crisis was coming, was inevitable. It wasn't unpredictable at all. So we have to model money, and debt out of equilibrium. And that comes to the second defence, which is, what's well, too hard? What's well, not? Uh, because the simple features we've got there can come from a, the features I'm going to show you can be reproduced by an incredibly simple cyclical model. So I'm going to start from a model from Richard Goodwin, which was a, a birthday present for Marx, as it happens. It's written in 1967, reproducing in mathematical form the cyclical model you'll find in Chapter 25 of Volume 1 of Capital written in 1867. So you said, well, the level of capital, roughly speaking, determines output. The level of output, roughly speaking, determines employment. The employment rate determines the rate of change of wages. Wages determine profits. Profits determine investment. Investment's the rate of change of capital. Now, that's a model, believe it or not. So to make it into a, something you can simulate, then you have a simple accelerator relationship between capital and output, a labour productivity relationship between output and labour, divide labour by population, you've got the employment rate. Have a Phillips curve argument. The rate of the Phillips curve times the level of wages the rate of change of wages. Profit is output minus wages. In the simple model that Gordon built, all, is, is, all profit is invested. Investment is the rate of change of capital stock. So that's the simple model. So let's put it together. And when I put it together in Minsky, and I, I won't simulate... Actually, I will bring that one up. I think we have a bit of time. This is now using the, the flowchart dynamics of Minsky. And if I now simulate, ah, I've got a rogue element I brought in there by accident. I hope it doesn't stuff the simulation up. Let's see. What you get is this model that's cyclical. So you simulate it. And this is why I use this as a basis for my Minsky model in the first place. As you said, you've got to have a cyclical model of the economy. 
I think this is the, the basic and ultimate cyclical model of the economy. So you get cycles of employment and wages share and they reproduce perfectly over time, which of course is not what happens. So you've got to embellish that a bit. And I added the realism that capitalism don't invest all their profits. They invest more than their profits during a boom and less during a slump. What's happening here? Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, and I use the linear investment function, very simple. So people actually accuse me of getting my results because they're having nonlinear functions inside my nonlinear model. I said, okay, I'll put linear functions in there and see what happens. Exactly the same behaviour. It's the structure of the economy that causes the essential nonlinearities. So I had a rate of profit, an investment function, and ignored where they got the funds from and what they did with the extra money, simulate that, and you get exactly the same outcome. Those cycles reproducing themselves. So we're only halfway there. The next thing is banks borrow money. Oh, sorry, firms borrow money from banks. When their desire to invest exceeds their retained earnings, they borrow. And when their desire to invest is less than their retained earnings, they pay off debt. So you get a basic equation saying the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits. And then, of course, you've got to pay interest on profits. What happens when you add that? This is why I say you can get an amazing insights out of a simple, complex model. Because the model I've shown you there is extremely simple. When I simulate it, watch what's going to happen to the employment rate. Notice the cycles are getting smaller. A great moderation, maybe. Notice the debt rise levels also rising which is what happened in the background, and neoclassical is ignored. Notice workers' share of output is falling. You go through a period of diminishing cycles and then rising cycles, and ultimately the economy breaks down. Now that, fundamentally, when you take a look at the economic data of the last 20 years, that covers those stylized facts. First of all, we've got a period of apparently declining volatility. And that's what neoclassical thought was a great moderation. Secondly, you've got rising volatility, and they had no idea where that came from, and have to have two separate explanations for the two phenomena. You've got a rising level of private debt to GDP, which happened, and they, they're still ignoring that, and you had rising inequality, because workers' share declining means capitalists are getting more of the profit and workers are getting... Actually, the bankers are getting more, which is what's been happening in the real world as well. And that's without having nonlinear functions and without having growth in the model either. When I add the others inside there, I... I I can summarise it in three verbal truisms if I reduce it to what's called a reduced form of set of equations. And these are three quite simple verbal statements. The employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and labour productivity growth. That's a truism. Okay? It's simply a logical statement. That will happen. Secondly, the wages share of output will rise if wage demands exceed productivity. That's also a factual statement. The third one I've added is private debt to GDP will rise if the rate of growth of private debt exceeds the rate of economic growth. That's also a truism. Now, those three verbal statements together, you couldn't say what the hell's going to happen verbally. Okay? I say, so what's going to happen? You've got to put it in a, in a complex systems model. And that's what I've done with that simulation there. So that's what happens now looking in three dimensions. That's the dynamic that's actually going on. You're caught in a vortex of rising debt. The cycles diminish for a while. It's actually known as the inverse tangent route to chaos. And we look at the empirical data. Of course, the empirical data is nowhere near as smooth as that and it's obvious, but the same basic relationship applies. Now, I first actually showed this model back when I did my PhD. A wonderful econometrician in my department, Eric Sowey, commented. I think he's forgotten he made the comment, but it's stuck in my mind. He said, Steve, if you've identified anything that actually exists in capitalism, we're in deep, deep trouble. <coughs> he wasn't wrong, was he? So that's what actually happened. And I can add more elements to the model. I can add prices based on a markup. I can add counter-cyclical behaviour for an economy. And I get a model which can behave as, as complex a fashion as you can see there. And it's also possible to tell policymakers, why don't you try to make the economy work better the way you think it will, like by cutting back uh, employment benefits and see what happens, and you end up with a, with a total crisis. So this is just showing a few more simulations in Minsky. This model, I think, also crashes. Let's see. Yep, out of the blue, you have inflation going down to zero, and then the economy will suddenly, without warning, tank. I won't let it... It's taking longer to run for the moment, for the moment for some reason. I'm not quite certain why it's taking so long to run. Oh, I've got the government inside there, pardon me. The government's stabilising it. Let's get rid of the government. That's always a good idea. OK, let's get rid of the government here. Right, no government now. It'll work much better than that. 
Simulate again. Series of cycles. Everything's perfect. Inflation's down to zero. Oh dear, the economy died. So that's the sort of modelling I'd like to have economists taking on these days rather than the equilibrium stuff they, they do. So that's my overall perspective. It's We, we have to change away from a, a, a complicated but flawed vision of the economy to a complex but accurate one. And we have to grow up, dump the 19th century fetish we have of equilibrium thinking, instead use the far from equilibrium models which are quite commonplace in genuine sciences today. Nothing I've shown you is, is, a, is extraordinary or surprising to anybody with a background in engineering or physics or biology. Get rid of methodological individualism. Neoclassical theory has done a great service to the world by proving it doesn't work. <laughs> then they've ignored the fact that they proved that and kept on going. We've got to use complex systems and emergent properties in general and dump the fantasy of barter. We live in a capitalist economy, it's inherently monetary, let's just get used to it and model the monetary system and do it in a stock flow consistent way with dynamics properly. It's all possible today with modern simulation tools like the ones I've shown you. Minsky is a contributor to this field, there's Ben Sim, Simulink and a whole lot of others. And of course multi-agent modelling is also possible, a whole range of different software packages now exist to do that, some of which are open source. And now progressive central banks like the Bank of England are starting to use big data systems as well, the data, where the data is the model. But of course you've got to intelligently choose the data you actually consider. And if you want to learn more about this, come and join me in Kingston. Thank you.